My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the President and CEO here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today. Um, a special welcome to our esteemed guest of honor, Prime Minister Imran Khan, and to the delegation who's traveled far to be here with him. Um, a warm welcome to everybody who's joining us online, and you can join the conversation at USIP on Twitter with hashtag Imran Khan USIP. And I'm delighted everyone could be here for the conversation today. This is a, the kind of conversation that is the hallmark of U.S. Institute of Peace, which was founded 35 years ago by Congress as an independent, nonpartisan uh, national institution dedicated to reducing international violent conflict. And we very strongly believe that peace is possible, that peace is practical, and it is absolutely essential for U.S and international security. So we pursue our mission by linking research with policy, with training, and with action, working on the ground with partners. Um, our Pakistan program is one of our largest here at the Institute, and we've been active in the country since 2011. We partner with a network of civil society organizations, innovators, scholarly, scholars, and policymakers uh, to support local programs, conduct research and analysis, and convene local peace builders. Um, we've supported programs in cities and villages throughout Pakistan. We focus on increasing uh, tolerance of diversity using arts, media, and culture to promote dialogue and peace education. Uh, USIP partners in Pakistan have reached more than 130,000 youth. Uh, and has helped support their peace-building activities. I've been fortunate to have a chance to visit and to see the extraordinary impact that these young leaders are having. We also work with other institutions, including the police, to promote police community relations and enable the police to be more effective at nonviolent means of addressing conflict. Um, we use our trusted networks in the U.S. government and in Pakistan to facilitate 1.5 and 2.0 dialogues to offer opportunities for policy specialists and those close to decision-making on both sides to think of other solution sets and, to con and offer innovative approaches to break through policy uh, uh, obstacles. So we have a long history also of hosting uh, Pakistan top political officials. Last year, we were honored uh, to host Pakistan's foreign minister, uh, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, who's here with us today. Welcome. Um, and we're also delighted to have with us Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S., uh, Asad Khan, uh, who's a good friend. Pleased to have you back with us. Um, today, of course, we are honored to have with us Pakistan's prime minister, uh, Imran Khan. This is his first visit to Washington since becoming Prime Minister last August. Um, we have had the honor of hosting him in the past. The last time you were here was in 2009. Uh, the Prime Minister comes to Washington at a particularly critical moment in U.S.-Pakistani relations. And yesterday, ho hopefully we'll hear more about it, he met with President Trump. Uh, for the first time to discuss cooperation between U.S. and Pakistan. So today we thank Prime Minister Khan for the opportunity to hear his insights into developments in Pakistan and what we can expect from Pakistan on the international stage. After uh, the Prime Minister's opening remarks, I'll host a moderated discussion with him and then take questions from the audience. We have people circulating with note cards. Please write down your question and pass them in uh, to a U.S. volunteer, and we'll also be taking questions from online. And with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Prime Minister Imran Khan. Much, uh, Nancy. Uh, the United States, uh, Institute of Peace. I want to uh, thank you for inviting me here and listening to my views uh, about Pakistan, Pakistan's policy. Um, and I start with uh, how someone like me, a sportsman for 20 years, international sportsman who ended up in politics. Um, 
I am the first generation Pakistani. My parents were born in colonial India. I was the first generation who grew up in an independent Pakistan. We grew up with a lot of pride. My parents reminded me always how awful it was to live uh, in a colonial, in a, in a country where you were not, you didn't have your freedom. So I valued the freedom uh, of being uh, in an independent country. And we took great pride when Pakistan started growing rapidly in the 60s. It's not used to my voice, I think it's too heavy. But in, the, in the 60s, Pakistan was the fastest growing country in the whole region. Uh, Pakistan was a country which gave us hope. We, we grew up feeling that this is a country with a destiny. And then things started going wrong from 70s onwards. And, uh, uh, and I was playing cricket for, for two decades, international sports, when I finished in the early 90s. And my initial thought after playing sport was to um, go into social work. I had already uh, started building a cancer hospital. My mother had died of cancer. And I realized that there was no cancer hospital in Pakistan, so I thought I would build one. Uh, specifically because poor people cannot afford cancer treatment. So I spent six, seven years of my life uh, after cricket building and then running the hospital. Uh, but it was during that time I realized that uh, this is a big country. Social work was not going to change it. The only way we would change our country is uh, joining politics. Change only comes through uh, when you head a government and bring about a change. Uh, and the reason why I, I joined politics was because I realized our politics was going uh, in a direction which was uh, leading Pakistan to nowhere. Problem with uh, most ex-colonial countries is, was exactly what, was, what, what Pakistan was facing. If you look at Africa, you look at uh, the independence movements in Africa and then the, uh, uh, the leaders who came from the independence movement once they assumed government, a similar pattern took place. The moment they got power, they used power for uh, benefiting themselves. Corruption was the main reason why countries could not reach their potential. And Pakistan was exactly that country which in the 60s, while it was going, taking off, from mid-80s onwards, it started going down because of corruption, corruption of the ruling elite. So my main, when I uh, formed my party in 1996, it was on an anti-corruption platform. And I campaigned for 15 years uh, in the political wilderness talking about corruption and could not make people understand the relevance, uh, the, the relation between corruption and poverty. People could not relate the two. Somehow in, in ex-colonial countries, people thought uh, taking money from the government was nothing wrong with it because it was, an, it was not your, your government. It was a foreign government which was ruling over you. So if you evaded taxes, there was, you know, you were, you were not doing anything wrong. And similarly, corruption. So. Uh, I formed my party, as I said, in 1996. Uh, For 15 years, I had only a few people with me, uh, and no one thought I had a chance. But then suddenly, people began to understand what I was saying. So the party then began to take off uh, about seven years ago. And in 2013, we formed uh, government in one of the four provinces. And uh, because of our performance in that one performance, uh, in, in that one province uh, in 2018, we won the elections. So what have I, what has been the main challenge since we've uh, come to power 10 months ago? Number one challenge was inheriting, inheriting a country which was bankrupt. We had the, the biggest current account and fiscal deficits, but worse, what corruption does is it, it's not just a question of bankrupting a country and, 
and money being laundered out of the country. What happens is the ruling elites, they, when they uh, make money, when they make uh, money out of corruption, they then have to take it out of the country because otherwise people would know, ask them questions, where did the money come from? So you suffer tw in two ways. Number one, the money which should go to human development ends up going into uh, people's pockets. But secondly, that, that money leaves the country. And in my opinion, which I spoke to President Trump yesterday, the biggest problem that the world faces is about a trillion dollars leaving developing and poor countries and either go, going into offshore accounts or they end up in uh, Western countries. And this is impoverishing, this is causing more deaths than through terrorism, than through drugs. The amount of people dying of hunger and disease, uh, lack of education, not cle having clean drinking water, is because of the ruling elites and developing world taking that money out and uh, parking it into, uh, as I said, offshore accounts or uh, Western countries. So we've, we've, we faced a similar situation. We had uh, uh, the, the biggest current account deficit and fiscal deficit. But the other aspect of corruption is that in order for the ruling elites to take money out, they have to destroy the state institutions. Because if the institutions are strong, they would not be able to take the money out. For instance, if your anti-corruption body is strong, if your justice system is, is working, is robust, if your uh, taxation department, like equivalent to the Indian Revenue here or, or the uh, IRS here, if these institutions are strong, you cannot take money out of the country. But, but uh, that's the biggest damage these corrupt ruling elites do to uh, uh, developing world. They destroy these institutions. So, you know, you can recover the money, but what you can't, to build institutions take, takes time. So what we are, the biggest challenge we have faced since we've been in power is trying to build the state institutions. And, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have succeeded, we have turned around uh, various institutions, but it is a slow process. Uh, the relationship uh, which we had with our neighbors, uh, of, uh, the other priority we have tried to uh, instill in Pakistan amongst the people is that we must have good relationship with all our neighbors. Because Pakistan at the moment, most of all, needs stability. We need stability to, for economic progress. We need peace. And so for peace, we need ha to have uh, a, 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 a good relationship with our neighbors. So first was me trying to reach out to India. India is, um, you know, uh, a country which we've had turbulent relationship with. But unfortunately, um, uh, because of one issue of Kashmir, uh, Whenever we have tried, whenever relationship has got started to move in the right direction with India, some incident happens, uh, and, and that's all related to Kashmir, we go back to square one. And so we, I, I reached out to uh, my counterpart in India, the Indian Prime Minister, uh, assured him that, you know, we, you, you come one step towards us, we will go two steps towards you, because the biggest problem India and Pakistan face is poverty. And the best way we can reduce poverty is if we start trading with each other. Um, the next was Afghanistan. We again have had a difficult relationship with Afghanistan. <coughs> uh, uh, and so uh, we have reached out. I have uh, invited President Ghani to Pakistan. And, you know, I've, it's a sort of long story, but we are moving towards. Fortunately, we're all moving towards the same direction. There's a convergence now in Pakistan, in the US, that there is no military solution in Afghanistan. So we're all working towards uh, the peace process. Uh, similarly with Iran, we've had sort of uh, uh, a decent relationship with Iran without, you know, it's not really a warm relationship, but a decent relationship with them. So we reached out to all our neighbors. 
Uh, and the next is the U.S. U.S. is a superpower. You have to have good relationship with the U.S., whether you like it or not. So, um, so I was a bit worried uh, when I was invited to uh, meet President Trump. Uh, do you know, I have never, I've been in limelight, public life for 40 years. And sort of when I've gone to meet people who are famous or well-known or in power, you, know, you normally get advice that, you know, how, how you, what you should do, what questions you should ask when you meet them. But never in my life have I had so many suggestions when I, before I was going to meet President Trump. <laughs> Inundated. And I have to say that it was one of the most pleasant surprises, not just for me, for my delegation. Uh, the way, the hospitality, the way he straightforward, charming way he treated us. So we were all blown over. We loved the meeting with uh, the president yesterday. But above all, we, we decided on how we will now have a close relationship uh, between Pakistan and the US. How we will now ensure that there is no communication gap. Uh, the, the period from 2003 or four to, to uh, 2015 was the worst in the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S. Pakistanis felt that they were fighting the U.S. war. It was, uh, no Pakistani was involved in 9-11. Uh, Taliban were in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. But Pakistan ended up involved in that war. And we lost 70,000 people. We lost over $100 billion uh, lost to our economy. And yet, there was mistrust. Pakistan felt it was doing its best. It, it could have stayed out of the war. And yet, Pakistan participated in the war, and Pakistan took a battering. There was a point when people like us thought, are we going to survive? Because there were suicide bombs going on every day. The, there were uh, no sports team used to visit Pakistan. Forget about investors. And so we passed through a terrible period, but at the same time, the U.S. thought we weren't doing enough. We were playing a double game. So that was, in my opinion, the worst, uh, it was the worst uh, 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 phase between the U uh, relationship of, between U.S. and Pakistan. Uh, I was one of those, and I, I came here, I think, in 2009, and I tried to explain to people here that there was no military solution in Afghanistan. I met, uh, then Democrats hadn't come into power, the elections hadn't happened just before uh, President Obama won the elections. Uh, I tried to explain to, I had a meeting organized, there's Dr. Ekram here, he organized a meeting with uh, Joe Biden, uh, John Kerry, Harry Reid, uh, towering figures of the Democratic Party. And I sat there and tried to explain to them the history of Afghanistan, of Pakistan's tribal area, and tried to explain to them that this, the, there will be no military solution. But I realized they had no idea. People in the US had no idea about the, about the uh, history of Afghanistan and the sort of conflict they had got involved in. Uh, and fortunately, this time, everyone knows, people understand. So uh, why do I think that we will now have uh, the very best of relationship with the US, because we, we are all on the same page. Previous, previously, Pakistan uh, army was, was, was supposedly fighting for the US, this, this war on terror, but the US did, did not think we were doing enough. And, and in Pakistan, we thought we had gone out of our way. This time, the Pakistan state, our security forces, the United States, all of us are on the same page, that, the, that peace in Afghanistan will now, can only take place through a political settlement, through dialogue. So we are all now working uh, on, on getting the Taliban to talk to the Afghan government. They're already, they're already talking to the US. And we hope that this will eventually lead to a settlement. Not easy. It's not going to be easy because there's no centralized Taliban command. It's a devolved movement. 
but we feel that if we all work together, we feel this is the best chance of there to be peace in Afghanistan. Uh, apart from that, uh, domestically, just one final word before I take your questions. Uh, I ha I've struggled these 23 years to, to, uh, to get into power. Uh, most of these, as I said, in wilderness, political wilderness. Uh, I was not fighting political parties. I felt I was fighting a mafia. And the Supreme Court of Pakistan, actually when there was this famous court case where the Prime Minister was dismissed, actually called the ruling party a Sicilian mafia. Uh, and I say a mafia because this is not normal politics. Because the, the, the two ruling families had been in power off and on for 30 years. And when you were in power for 30 years, they, their penetration was right down in the bureaucracy, in the judiciary, in the election commission. They had enormous amounts of money. And so we won because we mobilized the people. We mobilized the youth of Pakistan. Uh, we were very fortunate that uh, Pakistan has a 60% uh, of Pakistanis are below the age of 30. They became our big support. The young people rallied around us. And we did, it was a, the biggest pub, public movement in Pakistan in the last 50 years. And, and so we won despite having, uh, coming up against big money, despite the penetration in media, what, the, the most vilification campaign, uh, personal attacks, uh, and despite that we won because of social media. This is the new, it, had there been no social media, probably we would not have been able to beat the established parties. And since we have been in power, we are still up against the mafia. Uh, we have been, uh, the problem has been to fix the economy. But at the same time, we have had the entire opposition trying to destabilize uh, the country. So that twice they have tried to uh, create this uncertainty that there's been a run on the rupee. We almost had a run on the rupee because of them predicting that the all fake news that IMF had told us that the rupee would go to a, a certain number, all wrong, but putting pressure on the economy all the time. Finally, I, I can say right now, after 10 months, we have finally stabilized the economy, and we feel now that we are now, after stabilizing the economy, we feel that we can now move ahead and uh, start our reforms. Our reforms are very straightforward. We believe that real development is human development. So we are going to, all our money, all the, each, uh, we have decided that all the money which we retrieve from the, the criminal mafia, we have started a massive accountability campaign. We will then direct it towards human development. We've started one of the biggest poverty alleviation program in Pakistan's history, despite having financial constraints. But we believe that a country cannot rise if there's a small uh, lot of rich people and a mass of uh, poor ones. This is what's happened in Pakistan. The gap between the rich and the poor has, gone, has grown with each year. And uh, uh, the whole system is just caters for a tiny elite. The education system caters for just a tiny elite. T to give you an example, we have, we have uh, a total of students coming from what are the elite schools, English medium schools, are 800,000. The, the children who go to government schools, they are about 33 million. And then children who go to Dini Madrasas is 2.5 million. So we have three-tiered system. So the first thing our government is trying to do is to synthesize the syllabus, uh, bring in uh, science subjects, other subjects into dini madrasas, which are the uh, religious uh, schools. So bring them into the mainstream. Similarly, in the Urdu medium schools, teach them English. So that we equip them for higher ed education. So we're trying to bring the, the education system, which is the biggest problem our country faces, and the most difficult problem. So that's number one. Secondly is, uh, is the, the Pakistan taxation system. 
we have the lowest tax GDP ratio in the world. We have out of uh, a population of 210 million people, we have only uh, tax pay, barely people, uh, 1.5 million people pay taxes. So there's no way you can sustain a country if you do not ex uh, expand the tax base. So we are now are in the process, very difficult process, convincing everyone to come into the tax net. There are a lot of strikes going on right now, but we feel that we will be able to uh, overcome them. Uh, because it's imperative now that Pakistan, um, uh, the Pakistani people pay taxes. Uh, the, the challenge, of course, has been that the, this mafia, I call this mafia, in 10 years, just so that you understand what they have done to our country. Because later on, people, you might ask me, why is this political victimization? What I call accountability, people say political victimization. But I'll just tell you what they've done to our country in 10 years. The total debt of Pakistan in 2008, before these two parties came in, when General Musharraf left, the total debt of Pakistan in 60 years was six trillion rupees. In the last 10 years, they have taken it to, from six trillion to 30 trillion rupees. So where has this money gone? I've set up a commission, a debt commission, which is now going to find out where this money disappeared. So which is why we are going to, we, we are uh, going through this uh, problem of finding out what happened to our country? How come we got so indebted? So the, the problem with having such a huge debt is that in the last year, the total tax revenue which we collected, half of it went to servicing debts. So you can't have 210 million people just surviving on um, this uh, already a very low tax base and then uh, half of it going into debt servicing. So uh, for that, we are expanding our tax base. But what we are doing now in Pakistan is the first time in 1960s any government is going to take this step. We are now moving towards a, uh, encouraging industrialization. In 1960s, Pakistan, Pakistan's industrial production was equal to four Asian tigers industrial production, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand. The combined industrial production was equal to Pakistan's in 1960s. Uh, after that, unfortunately, we deindustrialized. Our exports actually went down because our policies just did not uh, encourage industrialization. So we now have embarked on a progr uh, program of indus industrializing our, our country. We are giving incentives to industry. So we have, uh, the main programs in Pakistan are number one, poverty alleviation. We have allocated the biggest amount to alleviate poverty. Any money retrieved from these big crooks will go straight into the poverty alleviation program. Secondly, industrialization. We are now encouraging our industry, uh, specifically export industry. We have uh, trade agreements, one with China, where, where we hope that uh, we will be able to have a, a, a free trade agreement with, uh, a preferential trade agreement with China, where we hope to export uh, our stuff to China. China has imports of $2 trillion. So industrialization. And third is agriculture. Pakistan is basically an agricultural country. And we are hoping to get technology transfer from Europe, from China. Uh, hopefully, uh, we've spoke to uh, companies in the United States so that we can improve our yields. Pakistan has the lowest yields, one of the, one of the most productive lands, but the uh, lowest yield. So what we hope is that this three-prong attack we will be able to raise uh, uh, Pakistan's uh, economy, uh, provide employment to our people, uh, improve productivity. So this is basically where we are headed. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, thank you for a very rich view of the challenges you're facing and the approach that you're taking. Um, I wanted to start, you, you gave us a taste of your meetings yesterday with President Trump. And in the past, you've spoken also about your um, commitment to take a different approach to U.S.-Pakistan relations than previous Pakistan leaders. And I'm curious 
if you wanted to say a bit more about what is the difference with your approach and how is that resonating during this visit in Washington and how do you see the, the future between U.S. and Pakistan? You see, Nancy, I always felt uh, uh, that the relationship with, between Pakistan and the United States uh, was never, was never uh, multi-pronged. It was basically a transactional relationship. So, for instance, in the 80s, uh, Pakistan uh, was fighting the, the jihad against the Soviets. And so the U.S. was helping Pakistan, was providing aid. And, and Pakistan was, uh, you know, the, the various groups created in Pakistan were then conducting uh, uh, attacks inside uh, Afghanistan against the Soviets. The moment that uh, jihad en the Afghan jihad ended, uh, the U.S. packed up and left. And, and not only did they leave, Pakistan was slapped with uh, uh, Pressler sanctions. So uh, Pakistan then was left with four million Afghan refugees, a, a, a number of militant groups which had been created to fight uh, the Soviets, all dressed up and nowhere to go. We had uh, uh, heroin, uh, drugs that were used to at some point to pay for the fighting in Afghanistan. So Pakistan, uh, then fir first time we had these sectarian attacks and sectarian militant groups, which were first time we heard of uh, sectarian attacks inside Pakistan. Then comes 9-11 and Pakistan again joins the U.S. I was then, uh, uh, I only had one seat in parliament at the time, and I remember when General Musharraf was consulting all of us that the U.S. wants us to join uh, them in the war. I opposed it. I thought Pakistan should stay neutral. And I'll tell you why I thought Pakistan should stay neutral. We had created these jihadi groups in the 80s. We had indoctrinated them in the idea of jihad that foreign occupation in Afghanistan, it was a religious duty to fight them. So all these gr groups, including Al-Qaeda, had arrived in Pakistan. Now comes 9-11, then the U.S. invades Afghanistan. And now we are trying to tell these same groups uh, who had close links with the Pakistan army, because they were created by the Pakistan army, now we are telling them that no, it's because the good guys are there, it's no longer jihad. Now, obviously, a lot of them turned against the Pakistan army because Pakistan army was then trying to uh, 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 neutralize them. So what we went through, and I just briefly mentioned earlier, it was the worst time in our history. These groups turned against the Pakistan army and the state of Pakistan. And not only that, there were linkages between, clearly there were linkages between these groups and the Pakistani security forces, because they, they had created them. So we had insider attacks, we had, uh, I mean, the, the, the GHQ was attacked, generals were killed, ISI headquarters were attacked. The army, at one point, the army could not go into the cities in, in, in military clothes or with military cars. It was that bad at one point. And then, of course, the second thing was the tribal areas we should never have sent army into the tribal areas because the tribal area per capita was the most weaponized area in the world. For people who don't know, tribal area is the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. It was, it was always an autonomous area. The British never occupied it during their rule uh, since uh, 1890. So it was an autonomous area. It, 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 it ran by its own rules. So in, nine, in, in 2004, under pressure from the United States, Pakistan army went into the tribal areas to flush out Al-Qaeda. Now, what happened was that when, after Tora Bora in Afghanistan, uh, a, a few of the Al-Qaeda moved into the tribal areas, which were semi-autonomous. So when they sent the army in, uh, you know, armies are not, meant to go into civilian areas. Whenever you send your army into civilian areas, 
you can ensure that there will be human rights abuses, there will be collateral damage, there will be peop the innocent people killed, because there's no army there. They're just guerrillas operating from, vill from villages. So, you know, the collateral damage created what became the Pakistani Taliban. There was no Pakistani Taliban before. So we then had, a, a, you know, the, the people of tribal areas suffered. One point there were these militants, the other side was the Pakistan army. Half of the tribal area was then internally displaced. Uh, the damage, we still haven't, the amount of damage done in the tribal area, we still haven't got the resources to, uh, to, to, to compensate them. So, so basically the country went through hell. In my opinion, we should have, we should have stayed neutral. That way the, we would have had control over these militant groups and we could have in our own time neutralized them. But because we became a, a part of the US war, they turned against Pakistan and so now what I feel, uh, there was a watershed in Pakistan, in Pakistani politics. In 2014, uh, the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, they slaughtered 150 school children in what was called the APS, the Army Public School. There was a reaction within Pakistan. All the political parties then signed a paper called the National Action Plan. And we all decided after that that we will not allow any militant groups to operate inside Pakistan. Uh, until we came into power, the, the governments did not have the political will because the, when you talk about the militant groups, they still have about 30 to 40,000 armed uh, people who have been trained and in some sort of a theater who fought either in Afghanistan, maybe in Kashmir. So we were the first government who has now started disarming all the militant groups. This is the first time it is happening. We have, we have taken over their, uh, uh, their, their institutes, their seminaries. Uh, we are now, we've got administrators there. So it is the first time in Pakistan that we have decided there will be no armed militias inside our country. Which, which relates to the next question I want to ask you, and it's been in the news a lot. It's clearly a significant element in US-Pakistan relationships, and that's what you refer to as well, the, the uh, ongoing Afghan peace process and uh, the possibilities uh, that we might actually have some breakthroughs is, and building on what you just said, um, are, is, is the Pakistan government uh, able and willing to, to make the, the commitments to really m help move these dialogues forward, especially in the event that the Taliban and the Af and Afghan government aren't able to get a meeting organized? Uh, it's just for people's benefit. Uh, the, the fear amongst the Pakistan military establishment was always that there would be a two-front situation. So there would be, you know, the Eastern Front, which is India. Mm -hmm. And then if Afghanistan was also uh, uh, in the Indian sphere of influence, then Pakistan would be sandwiched between these two. And so this was always the worry about the Pakistan military establishment, and which is why they wanted what was called the strategic depth. But this has changed today. There is no concept in Pakistan of strategic depth because we feel that by interfering in Afghanistan in order to secure the strategic depth, we have actually done a lot of damage to our own country and mm -hmm. for no rhyme or reason, we have become partisan uh, in Afghanistan's internal affairs. Now, and I speak for Pakistan army because you know normally there was that, you know, there's a, a Pakistan army is this independent entity and you know the governments have no control over it. I can sit here and tell you that I speak, as I speak, the Pakistan army is exactly behind the government's program. Whatever our policies from day one, we've arrived, peace with India, they were behind. When I decided to release the Indian pilot who had been shot down in Pakistan, uh, the army was right behind me. So I speak, to, we today speak as, uh, you know, that there's no difference between the, the policies of the Pakistan security forces or the Pakistan's democratic government. And we believe that we should not ever interfere in the internal affairs of Afghanistan. Let the Afghans decide what they want, what sort of government they want. 
and we should facilitate the peace process. So this is the big difference now. Okay. We are all on the same page, and fortunately now that the United States is on the same page too, because you know after you know the Einstein's definition of madness, trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. 70, 19 years of uh, conflict. And if they had gone, thank God for uh, President Trump, I mean, it, this could have gone on for another, another 19 years but without any result. But it sounds like you're willing to use your leverage with the Taliban to facilitate the peace process. You see, which uh, is a big, a big welcome change. The Taliban uh, delegation wanted to meet me a few months back. Uh, and they want, uh, and when I became the prime minister, uh, and it's because I always maintained that there was no military solution. While well, everyone else in Pakistan's political spectrum kept sort of agreeing that there was some military solution, so because of that, you know, I had a certain amount of credibility amongst them. They wanted to meet me, but the Afghan government at that point did not want me to meet them. So I, so I, 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 uh, I, st I did not meet them, but now when I go back after meeting President Trump and also I've spoken to President Ghani, now I will meet the Taliban and I will try my best to get them to talk to the Afghan government and so that uh, the, the election in Afghanistan must be an inclusive election where the Taliban are also participate in it. Um, I, I want to ask something that's very important to people here, um, and that is um, the view that uh, in, in Pakistan, censorship and harassment of the press, of activists and dissenting voices of women um, is on the rise. And you just spoke very eloquently about a new Pakistan, talked about the inequalities that have plagued the economy. And cl I, I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts and commitments about also protecting the pluralism and the, and the freedom of speech and of the media that's so important to a democratic Pakistan? Uh, for just, just let me say one thing. Uh, my government, and time will prove this, will be uh, the most inclusive government in Pakistan ever. We will try, we have already now uh, ensured full protection for our minorities. We have, uh, I won't go into detail, but there's one element where we still have a problem. But what we have done, no government has done before. And I'll give you an example that there was this case of Asia Bibi. She was this uh, uh, Christian woman who was jailed. And no, no judge would try them because of blasphemy. And because of the strength of one particular group, uh, which, which had the previous government uh, was held hostage by the group. They came in and they literally blocked the roads uh, and people were scared of that group. So when the judgment was given to free her by the Supreme Court, the same group then threatened, they, were, they came out on the streets, they were uh, rioting for two days and uh, uh, you know, the stage was held hostage for two days. But this is the first government that on the next opportune moment actually took, took them out. We put them in jails. We just completely, and Asia Bibi was then safely, she came out and then she wanted to leave the country and we helped her. So all I'm saying is that this government, will, you will see that it will treat its minorities as equal citizens. Uh, I just, uh, there's just one thing, I don't want to go into detail, but there's one aspect, I can't talk about it, but we have still a problem. I'm, I'm not saying we've completely uh, controlled the situation, but you will see that this is not out of worry about what the, uh, out, uh, the, 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 the uh, Western world or any other people say about us. It's because of, out of our conviction that our minorities, according to our religion, according to our constitution, are equal citizens. Now the media. You know, I have, uh, I mean, my life, I uh, went to university in England and I spent about 18 summers of my life in England. And I've seen the British media, very open, very, uh, very free media. 
द पाकिस्तान मीडिया इन माई ओपिनियन इज इवन फ्रीयर दैन द ब्रिटिश मीडिया देर इज देर इज द मीडिया इन पाकिस्तान आई मीन इज नॉट जस्ट फ्री बट समाइम्स आउट ऑफ कंट्रोल आई कैन टेल यू दैट इन ब्रिटेन इन ब्रिटेन no media would have come publish things like or said on television things like the pakistan media has done i can tell you since i've been in power i mean imagine uh, i i don't even think think in america this would be allowed even though the media has this love hate relationship with president trump uh, more hate than love sometimes but imagine that uh, uh, for uh, again a prime minister of a country and this man sits on television and says that i can tell you that he's getting divorced tomorrow <laughs> uh, so if there was some truth in it you know you would okay if he had some knowledge but there's only me and my wife living together where did he get this information from <laughs> but this sort of thing i mean i in the olden days i can tell you that this uh, guy would have been beaten up Nawaz Sharif's time, the, the the previous prime minister, he had journalists beaten up. Asad Zardari people were petrified of him. He would just people would disappear. In my time, I I tried. I went to the legal channels. I I reported it to the media. You know, I went into the court. All I'm saying is that what the media in Pakistan is, you will not find a media like that. And I I, I remember uh, the previous ambassador to uh, to to Pakistan. him saying that the media was out of control so what we need is to control the media and not through the government but through media watchdog uh, at the moment i mean the two or three things the media did one is that they started reporting wrongly that the imi imf had said that the rupee would fall uh, you know to to a number they quoted they almost uh, there was a run on the rupee i mean who would do that first you are fighting in a, the biggest economic crisis in your history second you have media coming up with this false news about uh, causing a run on the rupee or the finance minister's chain and so on so uh, what i'm i feel very strongly that we will strengthen uh, the the media watchdog it is not censorship we will strengthen the media watchdog but there are 70 channels or 80 channels in pakistan only three channels reported that there was they yeah. were having some problems so we have a whole afternoon's worth of questions for you um but before i go i just need to ask you one last question uh it's very important for usip's mandate and that is the number of international ngos that are raising concern about the increased difficulty of working in pakistan and you know fully understanding that the government has a role in registering these groups and in regulating the space um many of them are complaining of a very arbitrary process that ultimately is hampering very genuine efforts to work in partnership with pakistani organizations and the government and examples of forced expulsions um i is your government committed to addressing this issue it's been going on since before you took office mm-hmm. and i think there are hopes that you might be able to do something to make it a more transparent and fair process uh, absolutely um, uh, the foreign minister uh, is, has been dealing with this issue and we have uh, tried to work out to have these um, guidelines for media, uh, for ngos i mean i run the biggest more two biggest ngos in pakistan which is the the cancer hospital and the university but uh we did have problems and i can just frankly tell you the reason why these uh these uh, uh restrictions came uh there was an issue of uh, shakil afridi who was working for a for a uh, ngo the doctor the doctor and the ngo was what uh, what is save the save children save the children so so after that the the the, the result was that the the uh extremists militants started targeting uh, ngos uh, specifically we had one of our biggest problem was that the polio workers were being targeted so many of the polio workers were shot after that so so after that they we are trying to streamline it you know make sure that this doesn't happen again because that affected the uh, activities of other ngos in fact one of the ngos gave a statement condemning that 
NGOs should not be allowed for uh, espionage or, or that sort of th stuff. But we are already looking at it. Well, there, there were three German NGOs which had left Pakistan, but after being cleared, they've come back, and, and, and we're looking at a case-to-case -case basis. I know there'd be great appreciation for that. So, number of questions, um, none of them small. Uh, here's from Twitter. Any progress on restarting the U.S. security assistance? Some of these we can make rather short. No, uh, no, I never asked uh, for any assistance. Okay. Um, <laughs> also from asked for understanding, not assistance. Also from Twitter, what's an ideal Kashmiri solution from the Pakistan perspective and one that you believe the Pakistan people will accept? I think it should not be the Pakistani people anymore. It should be what the people of Kashmir want. And, and that really is the only solution. What do the people of Kashmir want? And, and, a pro and presumably a process that surfaces that and enables it to take hold. Do, do you know, uh, uh, they, I'm told because we had uh, three foreign ministers who were in other parties who joined us. One of them, of course, is Shah Mahmood Qureshi. Uh, and two of them told me that actually the, they came pretty close in the time of General Musharraf and when uh, Mr. Vajpayee was the Prime Minister of India. Apparently, they came pretty close. There was some sort of convergence on, on a phased... Uh, a, a movement on Kashmir on sort of, sort of various steps to be taken and over a period of time some sort of a referendum. Anyway, but I don't want to uh, say anything right now because it's a delicate issue. But there is a solution and the solution has to be with the will of the Kish people of Kashmir. Um, so you, you covered this, but I see about four questions going back to this issue of media censorship. Um, at, and here's one particularly that talks about TV channels are taken off, journalists are facing threats, the party's official Twitter uh, routinely cautions journalists of committing treasons. So in a country where many journalists have been killed, do you think such rhetoric will enable uh, and incite uh, violence and directly affect the freedom of the, of the press? Do you know, uh, Nancy, I am probably one of the biggest beneficiaries of uh, the media when we had free media. I gained the most because I was, un until then, until uh, 2001, there was only one television, and that was the national television, PTV, which was totally a government-controlled uh, television. So with the independent channels coming in, I became the biggest beneficiary because we didn't have any money. I mean, my party was pretty small for a long time. So I was able to go on television and give my point of view. And that's how my party gained, because I, was, I had a, a way of conveying uh, uh, my manifesto, my, uh, how I would deal with various issues. So there is no question in Pakistan of ever clamping down on the media. I can just tell you that. There is no question. <coughs> what, is, what happens is sometimes, and I will, you know, now that you keep asking you were stuck on media, so I'll just go, <laughs> I, I will just tell you a bit of truth about the media. You know, there is, as Lee Kuan Yew once famously remarked, what, he th what was sometimes called freedom of speech by the media or freedom of expression is sometimes the freedom of the owners of the media channels to conduct whatever they want to do. So in Pakistan, what we've had, we had the situation where here we were fighting. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you know of the Panama Papers, uh, the Panama Revolutions. So this Panama Revolutions came uh, about like the WikiLeaks, and our prime ministers, uh, we discovered that he had these luxury apartments in London, most expensive Mayfair, uh, he had these four luxury apartments. So like a opposition, like in anywhere in the de democracy, we asked him, where did you get the money to buy these flats? And then started this whole movement to uh, get him to answer these, uh, these questions. Now, there was a court case in the end, and in the court, he was convicted. 
But do you know there, were, there was a media channel, one of the most powerful media channels, they did everything to protect him. Now this is not what a media is supposed to do. The media did everything. They covered up for him, not just protecting him. I, who was asking my democratic right a question to asking someone, where did you get the money? I was attacked, personal attacks. I mean, the, the sort of attacks I faced, no political leader I challenged, no political leader would have gone through the sort of personal attacks they went, because you know, they couldn't attack me on, my, um, uh, on, on integrity, so they, they went on these personal attacks. So this is not normal for media to do this. Media is not supposed to do this. Media is supposed to be a watchdog, to bring out, uh, you know, play the role of an opposition. But they're not about personal attacks and trying to blackmail you. We just had another, uh, another case right now. There's a judge who convicted the previous prime minister. Now this judge, the opposition brought out a video blackmailing him about him with some compromising video with some woman. They brought this up. This happens in Italian mafias. It doesn't happen in democracies. So I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, you, I firmly believe that we eventually we will have to move where the media owners will have to disclose their source of income. You know, just like anyone else, they'll have to say how much tax do they pay, what is the source of income. Even if you ask them uh, how much tax you paid, some of these media say this is a freedom, uh, it's against freedom of expression. So looking at it from that perspective versus a censorship regime, but more of a transparency uh, effort is the focus. And, and Nancy, accountable media. Media should also be accountable. You know, you can't have a media sort of uh, protecting criminals in a society. Okay, we're gonna move it, the conversation. Here, there are a number of questions about Afghanistan. I think you've covered that. But here's one uh, specifically asking, how do you view the peace talk, the peace talks about Afghanistan hosted by uh, both Russia and Uzbekistan? Uh, you know, we should really uh, uh, get all the neighbors of Afghanistan involved with the peace talks. Because this is, it, it, it should be the interest. Uh, Pakistan, the United States, and Afghanistan. These three countries today are the most interested in having peace in Afghanistan. But not all neighbors are interested in peace in Afghanistan. And because, you know, for various reasons, people have their own, other countries have their own agendas. So I firmly believe uh, that the U.S. should try and co-opt as many countries as possible uh, because um, there will be people who will be trying to, uh, uh, you know, um, put a spanner in the works. And so if the neighbors are all involved, there's a much better chance of uh, the, the talks going smoothly. And speaking of neighbors, there's a question saying what, and, and you mentioned this in your opening remarks, what, what role can Pakistan play in easing the rising tensions with Iran and a number of other countries, including the United States, without damaging some of your other relationships? How are you thinking about that? You see, Pakistan is, uh, you know, we're really indebted to Saudi Arabia, we're indebted to UAE, uh, because the way they came forward, you know, when we were confronted with this, uh, when we took over government, we only had two weeks uh, of foreign exchange reserves. So we were staring at a default, and these countries came forward to help us, and so we are really indebted to them. Uh, but my worry about Iran is, um, uh, I, re I think, I I'm not sure whether uh, all the countries realize the, uh, uh, the gravity of the situation if there's a conflict with Iran. People don't understand, uh, you know, uh, this is not going to be the same as Iraq. This could be much, much, much worse. It will have great consequences for Pakistan, adverse consequences for our, for our country. Uh, it could unleash terrorism which, would, uh, which people would forget Al-Qaeda and those types because the Iranian, the, you know, the, the Shia uh, element in Islam is very cohesive. They have 
a much greater uh, sense of martyrdom than the Sunni Muslims. Uh, you know, it, the, the battle might be quite short if, you know, if, 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 if it goes ahead and, you know, bombing uh, uh, airfields and so on. But the consequences after that, my worry is that uh, not many people fully understand it, and I would strongly urge that there should not be, this, this conflict should not, there should not be another military uh, situation. Pakistan has already suffered. I said as I, what we went through these uh, last 15 years, the last thing we want is another conflict on our borders. And you know we would do anything. I mean, if any role Pakistan can play in this, uh, we have already had, uh, suggested this to Iran. Uh, until recently, Iran was willing. But then when somehow I felt that Iran is getting very desperate, and I do not think they should be pushed into a situation where where this leads to a conflict. Another question via Twitter. Um, what are some of the concrete steps your government is taking to ensure that the military operates under civilian leadership? Something you alluded to in your earlier comments. You see, uh, in Pakistan, uh, we had three martial laws, and uh, the last one was General Musharraf's. I think General Musharraf's martial law was a watershed in Pakistan in the sense that there was an opinion across the board that when you have bad democracy, uh, the answer is not to have a military government. Because the mili military government comes in, it's like uh, curing cancer with disprin. For a while you feel good because they are organized, the, it's an organized institution. But eventually, uh, you know, you, you, you end up in even a worse situation because then democracy, st democracy starts all over again. And what we need in Pakistan now is an extended run of democracy. And I, do, I really do believe that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the democratic evolution of the country has reached a point where now we will go towards further democracy. I mean, us winning the election is, is, you know, who would have thought we would have won an election against these? Uh, how many times in a two-party system has a third party uh, broken through? It's, uh, it's unheard of. I mean, nowhere in the world does a third party break through. We broke through because of social media. We actually, uh, uh, despite the official media sort of not giving us that sort of coverage, all the opinion polls were that we would not make it. But it was the social media and the young people who, who came out and, uh, and made us defeat the two established parties. And I think the process will keep going on. I think that uh, in Pakistan, people have tasted freedom. They understand uh, you know, the power of the vote. In fact, social media has actually democratized the whole world. Everyone now has, you know, they can... They have Twitter, they can, everyone can participate. That's you know? how we're getting questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have two related qu questions on, uh, that I think build on the vision that you just articulated. And the first is, what will the government do to address closing space for civil society? And how does that fit into your vision? And cl closing space for civil society and, and activists. I, I don't understand. How is, how is the government? Well, I think it's. You're closing space for civil society? I th th there's, there's another question about uh, uh, Gulale Ishmael and other activists. Um. You're talking about PTM. PTM. <laughs> yeah, that's it, PTM. It's called civil. So they're, the, I think they're saying it's a broader civil society question, but. It's, it's actually it's related to PTM. Look, you know, all these years I kept saying, uh, you know, when Pakistan, I stood up in the National Assembly in our parliament in 2004. I objected to the Pakistan army going, being set into our tribal areas. No one understood the tribal areas. I, the only reason I understood the tribal areas is because some 30 years back, I wrote a book on the tribal areas. I did a travel book. I went all over and I sort of, I, so I understood the tribal areas. The, as I said, it is one of the most weaponized per capita uh, area in the world. 
the, it's a, a most devolved democracy. It, every village is an, a, is an independent entity. And so uh, they, have, they have never uh, allowed outside interference to come into the tribal areas. So when Pakistan army was being sent there in 2004, I kept, I stood in the parliament, tried to explain to them that the greatest number of losses when the British were uh, uh, ruling India, they suffered the greatest uh, uh, number of losses in Waziristan, which is tribal area. So we should never have sent army there. Whenever you send an army into civilian areas, there are massive uh, collateral damage and massive casualties and, and destruction. So all the time when I was speaking out against this, I was being called Taliban Khan. I was being called pro-terrorist. General Musharraf, I remember, in a meeting said that I am a terrorist without a beard. And, and so once this whole thing was over, uh, this, this young Pashtun movement started. And this Pashtun movement was correct, what they were saying. The area was devastated. The people of the tribal areas, I mean, half of them were internally displaced. The shops were gone. They, most of them uh, uh, relied on livestock. Livestock disappeared. The whole area was, as it is, uh, tribal areas uh, before 2001, 75% of the people were under the poverty line. So after this military action, they even went further down. So uh, we had this young movement and, and movement stemming out of anger. And they, of course, they blamed the Pakistan army uh, for, 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 for all the uh, devastation there. And um, we've just had elections in the tribal area now. We've just had first time in Pakistan's history, the tribal area has been assimilated with Pakhtunkhwa, a province. And first time we've had election, and I'm very pleased to say that PTI won the election. Um, but we have now injected the greatest amount of money in the tribal areas to develop it. Never has so much money been, been uh, allocated for development there. But you know, the, the reason why there were problems was that the PTM leadership started attacking the army. And they kept, uh, uh, attacking the army and the last thing happened was that they actually civilians charged an army post, there were few people killed and that's why there were restrictions. But now it's settling down because we've had a peaceful elections in the tribal areas. So I think we will now move on. Yeah, I think the question was probably triggered a bit by the New York Times article about the harassments and arrests of this Gulali Ishmael family and friends. I wish that they would, uh, the New, New York Times would also take the, the other point of view. Uh, now I'm sounding like President Trump. <laughs> um, so we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, the U.S. has been asking Pakistan to do more in the context of terrorism. It relates a little bit to what you were saying. Um, they particularly were asking Pakistan to do more in the context of, of Jam. And uh, after the arrest of Hafiz Saeed, is this it? Will he be, stay in custody this time, uh, or will be he allowed to go off again? Now, you ask, first, we want an independent justice system, and you want me to predict what the justice system would do. No, look. Let me just say, I, I repeat one thing again. It is in the interest of Pakistan that we do not allow any armed militias in our country. We have suffered. The country has suffered sectarian attacks. We have had the worst situation. It has affected our investment. Pakistan has not, it, it has destabilized us. Uh, this whole thing, Palwama, this, what happened, uh, uh, in, in February last year, um, it was clearly an indigenous thing. It was a Kashmiri boy radicalized by the brutality of the security forces. He blew himself up. But because uh, this group claimed responsibility, which was, all, which was in India as well, Jashim Muhammad was operating in India, but Pakistan suddenly came in the limelight. 
So even before this had happened, we had already decided that we would disarm all militant groups in Pakistan. And it is in Pakistan's interest, I repeat, it's in our interest, because the country has had enough of militant groups. You know, we had uh, ethnic groups, militant groups. We had, uh, in Balochistan, we still have militant groups operating. Then we had these various religious groups. So there is a decision now, and by the way, it is across the party. Every political party has signed the National Action Plan. Uh, Pakistan is now determined, and you know, normally it was said that the security forces patronize the groups. The security forces, we would not be disarming them if the security forces were not standing behind us. You cannot disarm because the police is incapable of disarming these groups. They are trained, I mean, they have, these people have experience of, uh, uh, of, of fighting in Afghanistan, some in Kashmir. The police cannot go after them, so it's the army that is helping us disarm all militant groups in our country. Mr. Prime Minister, you have been very generous with your time. We have so many more questions that we won't be able to get to. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, but before we close, I want to ask one last question, which is, this is your first visit here uh, as Prime Minister. We have a very distinguished audience here of policymakers, people in and out of government, people who care deeply about the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. What final message would you like to leave uh, as a closing thought for everyone? I would like to, uh, my message uh, from my trip, uh, first trip uh, as, uh, as the Prime Minister to the U.S., I would like to have a relationship uh, Mutual, uh, between the two countries of mutual trust. I would like to uh, have a relationship as equals of friendship, not as it has been before, that where Pakistan has sort of been, you know, it's like Pakistan wanting aid from the US and then as for aid, Pakistan is expected to do certain things. Uh, the reason why I'm happy leaving the US this time it, because we have a relationship now based on a mutual interest, which is peace in Afghanistan. And, you know, if someone asked that, will you get this fund? I hate the idea that we would be asking for funds, not U.S., from anyone. Because this is, aid has been one of the biggest curses for my country. What it has done is... What it has done is it has created the dependency syndrome. We have become, you know, I, I, when I went on my first trip to Saudi Arabia, I came back, what have you got from there? As if I'd gone there to beg for money. And I think it's humiliating for a country. Countries rise because of self-respect and self-esteem. No countries rise by begging and borrowing for money. So, my relationship with the U.S. would be, uh, I would like a relationship, with, uh, a dignified relationship with the U.S., where uh, never again should we ever have this, this, that humiliating phase. I can tell you as a Pakistani, never did I feel more humiliated when Osama bin Laden was taken out in Pakistan by the U.S. Uh, uh, troops. Never did I feel more humiliated because uh, here was a country which was supposed to be an ally, and our ally did not trust us. So as a Pakistani, it was, for every Pakistani it was humiliating. We never want to be in that same position again. We want to have a relationship of friendship. And it doesn't matter, you know, friend can be rich and the other can, can not be so rich, but so what? You, you know, it's, it's about a dignified relationship, and that's what I hope to have to be with. I'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation for your visit Thank here. You, uh, invite you to come back and wish you all the best. Please join me in thanking the Prime Minister. Thank you.